Welcome to uh, Eight Dogs and a Wife video series on starting a successful home-based business. This morning, we're going to teach you how to make all-natural soap uh, for many reasons. Some people are looking to uh, just learn a new skill. Others of you might want to start homesteading like we are. We're sitting at base camp here with our eight Marema puppies. Uh, my name is Brian Cockle, my wife Fonda. And uh, this morning we're going to teach you how to make all natural soap. And uh, other folks might want to get rid of the synthetics that you're slathering all over your body with store-bought soap. Most of it is uh, carcinogens and synthetics and parabens and phthalates and coal tars. Uh, it's really um, <laughs> not natural at all. And it's uh, detergent, Shiver. not a soap. So we're going to teach you how to make all natural soap. Shiver. Uh, Shiver. Others might be looking to um, start a home-based business and uh, start a soap making company or a, a skincare, all natural skincare company. So this morning's video is going to be teaching you how to make all natural soap. A comprehensive video from start to finish. And by the time we're done, we're going to have ourselves a whole bunch of bars of lavender natural soap. So let's go and make some soap. Okay, I'm at my workstation and we are ready to make all natural lavender soap. How nice is that? Okay, so I've uh, pre-prepared all of my raw materials. Uh, I've made sure that I have enough of each and I'm going to do two cooks today. And a cook to me is 16 bars, so we're going to make 32 bars. So we're going to do two pots worth. Uh, so i uh, prepared all of my utensils, uh, my measuring cups, um, everything I need, my scales, my spoons. Uh, wipes, um, my isopropyl alcohol, everything I need is ready and prepared to get going so I don't have to go looking for anything. So very first step of course is always to uh, take some isopro, 99% alcohol and I sterilize everything. I don't like to wear gloves until I get into the lye. So I isopro my hands and all of my work surfaces, all of my utensils, my pots, uh, my measuring cups, my scales, everything gets isoproed. And it's not absolutely necessary for making soap, uh, but if you do want to move on to move to make other things like um, hand cream, for example, which we do do, uh, you will want to make sure that um, there's no bacteria whatsoever anywhere on anything uh, because a hand cream is a water and oil solution and it's subject to molding. So it's a good habit to get into. So you know you're working with a clean environment, and you know that everything is bacteria free. I always work with stainless steel tables, so all my tables are stainless steel. Reason being, easy to clean up, easy to sterilize, and a nice flat work surface for my scales. And anything you spill can just simply be wiped up. I don't use plastic because plastic gets pitted um, over time and it gets discolored over time and it's hard to clean after uh, you've had a bit of wear and tear on it and I never use wood because wood uh, for the same reason hard to clean splinters over time uh, wears out and you certainly don't want wood splinters in your soap so uh, everything's ready to go so what we're going to do is we're going to first measure out all of our raw materials and I'm going to do that in these two pots here and then once that's completed that's step one and then we're going to put it into our crock pots we are making hot processed soap this morning However, um, you could as, e as easily be making cold process because there's only two changes uh, as you go through the process and I'll tell you what they are as we go on. Uh, but the first step, measuring all your ingredients, exact same for hot process or cold press soap. So um, what, I, what I use is I use Pyrex um, glass uh, measuring uh, cups and the reason being I prefer glass uh, because it's easy to clean. I can also see through it at all angles to make sure I have not picked up any contaminants or any flies, for example, if you do happen to have one in the room. Uh, easy to clean, easy to handle. Uh, some people have commented that, you know, use over time, you can get pits when you're putting lye in it, um, uh, uh, micro cracks. I've been using these for over six years now. 
I probably have over 40 of these in different sizes and I've never noticed that. I've never had a problem. Um, however, I will point that out. Some people do use plastic and that's fine. Um, always use um, a silicone spatula. Uh, you want something that is very flexible like this one here and that is great for getting every drop of oil out of your measuring cups uh, and your butters uh, because when you're making soap of course uh, you want everything measured to the gram and to be exact. So you don't be leaving stuff in your pots. Uh, wood's too rigid and plastic's too rigid. Uh, my spoons, I use stainless steel. I like to use a nice solid spoon because sometimes you're digging out uh, you know, hard coconut oil or um, you know, hard, hard um, cocoa butter or hard avocado butter. You want a nice solid spoon. I also like it with a rounded handle because when you're digging in there uh, this if it isn't round and a nice good grip uh, it will dig into your hands so for example using a one like this that's going to hurt your hands pretty quickly okay so when you hold that that that'll start to hurt after a while so you want to use a nice rounded stainless steel spoon <coughs> excuse me and of course I use uh, stainless steel as well for uh, my little utensils all right so uh, I have my ISO with me all my raw materials, I have some tissues uh, and some paper towels ready for cleanup. On my scales, I have two types. I'm trying a new one for the last couple weeks. Uh, this is a Taylor scale. On your scale, you want to have a sealed unit. So these buttons here are sealed and I can't spill anything into the electronics. Nice glass top. Uh, so uh, again, easy to clean. Uh, I do have, my normal scales are one solid unit. I think I like that better. Again, try something different. And this one measures to 0.5 of a gram, which is great for your oils and your butters. Uh, I use a little Escali scale. Um, this one is uh, measures to one tenth of a gram, and that's great for things like your essential oil, um, you know, your your kaolin clay, uh, your stearic acid, uh, and your lye. Uh, things that you want to make sure you get your measurements right to a tenth of a gram. So this little one measures a tenth to a gram. So um, with that, everything's ready. I'm ready, so I'm going to start mixing materials. Now what I'll do is I'll do a couple, and then uh, just to show you how I work my scale, and my cups, and my tearing mechanism on my scale, and then I'm going to do um, you know, a time lapse uh, to speed up a little bit um, as I go through this. So uh, I do have my recipe ready, and uh, today recipe is Signature Series Lavender Soap. All right, now if you do want to uh, um, uh, go uh, make your own recipe. Uh, I have um, a companion uh, YouTube video on making a recipe to make soaps and how to do that. Um, it's in the link uh, below and you can, uh, if you do want to make uh, your own uh, soap recipes up, um, I teach you how to do that. Okay, so today we happen to be making uh, a lavender soap. Um, that's, uh, we have a base recipe and then we sent it and add some additives. So um, off we go. So we're going to start with our uh, coconut oil. Now because you want to be so specific on your ingredients, I use a highlighter and as I mark, uh, fill up my ingredients into my measuring cups, I do mark them off of my recipe. Okay, so I've got my coconut oil. So first thing I do is uh, turn my scale on. Now once it's on, place my measuring cup on, and all these little scales, uh, this one is good up to uh, um, 11 pounds, or about 5 kilograms, you always want to hit tear, and when I do that, my scale is now reading zero, alright? Now my first ingredient is 374 grams of coconut oil, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in here. Okay, so once I finished cup one, I'm going to set that aside. As I said I'm making two pots, so I put my second measuring cup on, hit my tear unit because the, uh, uh, the base weight will be uh, a little different between the two, and I'm going to do a second one of 374 grams of coconut oil. So coconut oil is in, and I always Turn my ingredients to where they belong. Always want to keep a nice even 
uh, neat clean work surface. So now that I have coconut oil in my two pots, I didn't have to move that aside, but I am for this purpose. What you want to do is you want to clean up your utensil, unless you're using a second one. And you can put this one away, but I don't like to create too many dishes. So I simply clean this spoon off really nice. And the only cleaner I use in the entirety of my soap studio is isopropyl alcohol. You don't need all those fancy cleaners. You simply take your isopro, you clean up your utensils, and good as new. And because you certainly also don't want to cross contaminate uh, between your different uh, uh, different oils and butters. So that spoon is nice and clean again, and it is ready to go. Next ingredient. Oh, now I'm going to mark off that I've put that in both of my pots. So I'll take my recipe, coconut oil in, in. Next ingredient on my list is uh, palm oil. So I'm just going to show you the palm oil um, and then I'm going to speed the video up. Okay, so I'll take cup number one. Now, if I re tear my scale, my scale's back at zero and it doesn't know that it has coconut oil in there. I'm going to put in 599 grams of olive oil. So I've got a zero tear on my scale. Measuring cup one. And take that to 599. Now you might say that's funny looking olive oil. It's not. It's just a little cool because it was sitting in a room overnight at about 10 degrees. So it's thickened up just a little bit, but it's absolutely fine. It doesn't affect it at all. Now that one's all gone. And like I said, you want to be prepared. So I happen to have a second one out here and ready, knowing that I was going to run out of my first bottle. So I'm going to retear my scale for cup number two. Open up my new olive oil. And put five. So I've teared this back to zero and 599 grams of olive oil bucket number two is going in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put in my palm oil, my castor oil, my stearic acid, and then um, I'll speed the video up just a little bit as I do that, and then we'll go to step two, which is getting our ingredients into our crock pot. Um, for all the uh, hate mail I'm gonna get when they hear the word palm oil, uh, we source our palm oil from Madagascar. Uh, it's ethically sourced Madagascar. Uh, highly regulated Madagascar, no issue. The issue with palm oil is from Ecuador where they uh, are clear cutting the uh, palm trees and decimating the orangutan habitat. So uh, if you're going to use palm oil, it simply makes the best base soap. Um, you, you, can, you can source that from Madagascar and uh, ethically source it and uh, it's not an issue okay all right so i'm going to go ahead and complete um, the rest of my ingredients here Okay, there we go. So we have two measuring cups with two cooks of soap. The only thing we're missing is our lye and our water. So, um, and of course, uh, we're going to go to station two next. And with lots of practice, uh, maybe you'll be able to work as fast as I just did. <laughs> All right, just kidding. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these measuring cups over to our cooking station, which happens to just be behind me. You want everything nice and close and efficient. And we're gonna put these in our pots and start to get this oil heated up. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, I'm at my cooking station. I have my two uh, crock pots set up and uh, ready to go. I have my raw materials over here and ready to go. My spatula, ready to empty out my measuring cups and uh, I just wanted to point out now there's um, if we were doing cold process soap 
instead of putting our raw materials into our crock pots, we would simply put them into a large soup pot. Uh, and I use uh, soup pots with uh, invection um, burners, uh, which work absolutely great. They're tabletop units and uh, they look just like this. So hot process, we're going into a crock pot. Cold process, you would put it into um, a soup pot. I cook a triple batch in my soup pot, so I do six batches at once. Um, crock pots, uh, I've tried every crock pot out there, and I always go back to the original uh, crock pot, uh, which looks like this. So you want to have a crock pot that has a high setting, a low setting, and a warm setting. Uh, and then you also, which I find important, is you want to have a lid that has a rubber um, on it because uh, it fits the pot better, it keeps the seal a little better. Although I don't use the lid for soap, which we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit when we get there. Uh, but if you're going to be making things like um, shampoo bars, for example, um, it's good to have a lid that actually seals down on both sides, has a vent and the rubber, and you can get that uh, the original crock pot. These are cheap. Um, I think I pay 40 bucks for them. Uh, these two here have lasted uh, about six years so far. Um, I have eight in total, and uh, sometimes you know I'll cook up to eight, but it's um, it's a great little machine. It's all you need. You don't need the fancy ones. So um, a good, uh, just regular standard crock pot. The original model is much better. Uh, people have commented uh, about you know, using all the Isopro. Doesn't that dry your hands out? No, my hands are soft as a baby's bum. And the reason being is I use... Life Jevity Soap Company, all natural, aloe vera, non-greasy hand cream. <laughs> all right, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, best cream in the known universe and beyond. Just wonderful. Oh, it smells great too. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, fill up our pots and turn them on. So at this point, I'd move my lids around. Now you notice after continual use, your crock pots will start to become a little dull and discolored. Um, that doesn't matter. It, it doesn't affect your soap at all. It doesn't affect the, uh, uh, the cook at all, uh, the quality of the pot. Uh, the lye over time just kind of dulls them up. Um, you'll find the same thing with your stainless steel, but again, it doesn't affect anything. So we're going to put our raw materials, which we measured out a few minutes ago, into our pots. Now what you do want to do is you want to try and get every drop out of here you can because I said it's important that um, uh, we have enough oil in here to saponify with our lye. Now I do what's called super fatting so I add on my recipe about 4% extra oil so that guarantees all my lye is going to get saponified and it also is great for uh, the moisturizing content of your soap. So. Um, it's spectacular. I've seen people, uh, soap makers, saponify at 2%, um, sometimes all the way up to 15%, but I find anything over that 4 to 6% uh, gives you, um, your, your soap so starts to get a little soft and you don't want that as well. You want a nice hard bar that's going to last a nice long time, but not too long. If you're going to be selling it for sure. Okay, so there's pot one. Got that nice and clean. Set that aside for cleaning. And you'll notice when I finished the measuring of my ingredients, I cleaned everything up as I go. You want to have your work surface nice and neat, nice and clean, and uh, not stuff all over the place. Perfect. Okay. So, now that that's in there, I'm going to set this aside for cleaning, which I'm going to do in a second. I'm just going to distribute this a little evenly in here. All right. Get this one distributed a little evenly. Okay. And this gets set aside for cleaning. Alright. On go the lids. So in this step here, what we're going to do is we're going to heat our oils and our butters up to 140 degrees. And I set my pots on high to do that. Get a nice tight seal on your lid. Uh, it'll heat up quicker and you'll lose less moisture. So uh, I'm going to put both these on high. Right there. 
All right, that's going to take about, eh, uh, again, it depends how cold your ambient temperature is in the room. Um, you know, on a day like today where it's 14, 15 degrees in my soap studio, uh, it'll take about, you know, 40 minutes to, to heat those oils to 140 degrees. And uh, on a nice warm summer day, if you don't have your uh, work area air conditioned, uh, that could be much quicker. You can heat your oils in, um, you know, 20 to 25 minutes. So as those are heating, I'm going to clean up a little bit from this process and then I'm going to go measure out my water and my lye and get ready for a lye. So once these pots reach 140 degrees, I mix my water with my lye. It's going to heat up to about 200 degrees uh, once you do that, depending on, again, your ambient temperature of the room. And then uh, this will cool down to about 120 to 125 while my lye is cooling down to about 120, 125. So you want your lye solution with your water and your oil solution uh, between 110 and 125 degrees before you incorporate them together to actually start the process of saponification. So we're gonna let these heat up. I'm gonna go do my uh, measuring for my lye and my water and I'll see you over my lye station um, in one second. Okay, great. Okay, here I am at my live station. A couple of things you're going to want to know here is I've prepared uh, all my raw materials. So 16 grams of kale and clay times two. We're doing two pots. 262.4 grams of lye measured to the one-tenth of a gram times two. And then we have 687.8 grams of water in each of our cups here. Okay, so our raw materials are ready. And uh, we have our face mask ready and our gloves because now that we are working with lye, uh, we're going to make sure we're suited up properly in our safety gear. Uh, good to have a long sleeve shirt on or a smock. And you certainly want to have closed toed shoes. Would even be better to have rubber boots. All right, so you want to make sure you're not uh, splashing any lye anywhere on you. Lye is caustic, it'll give you a chemical burn if it gets on you but nothing to be afraid of because we take precautions. So the precautions we've taken here is we've placed our water inside an outside ceramic dish. So if we do have any spillage, it'll spill into this dish here. We also have vinegar on hand, all right? Vinegar neutralizes lye. Now you can have vinegar in a spritzer bottle like this, or you can have a bowl with vinegar and water and a cloth beside you, a 50-50 mixture. This is a 50-50 mixture, water to vinegar, um, and of course, you want your eye wash station uh, close by, and I have mine beside the camera here on the wall, but you can't see it because my camera's fixed, all right? Also, uh, when you mix your lye into your water, never your water into your lye, um, always lie into the water. Reason being is that you could have a volcano uh, circumstance if you do it the other way around, so always mix lye into your water, and then above me, again, which you can't see because I have a fixed camera here, is a large exhaust hood. So just before I mix, I'm going to put on my safety gear and put that exhaust hood on. If you do splash any lye in yourself, um, you simply neutralize it with vinegar, a good dose, your vinegar and water mix, and then go to your sink, which is just beside me here on the other side, and a good wash with soap and water for about 15 minutes. Uh, so just neutralize your lye and you're absolutely fine. Okay, now as far as our equipment goes, again, I'm using glass measuring cups. Uh, it's my preference. I'm using ceramic cups for uh, my, uh, my kaolin clay. And I only use products that are not sensitive to lye. So for example, uh, ceramic, glass, stainless steel, you can use plastics, but I don't prefer to use plastics and silicone, okay? Never use aluminum when it comes to uh, lye. Aluminum has a nasty reaction with lye, so you want to avoid all aluminum, all right? Now I have my whisk here. On your whisk, I use a medium-sized whisk for this, stainless steel end, and I like the rubber handles and or the silicone handles. And the reason being is if you have an all-metal unit, when you mix your lye and your water together, it's going to heat up really fast on a, you know, if you're in a warm summer day, that's going to heat up over 200 degrees, usually about 220. And on a cooler day, like I'm in here today, um, you know, it's still going to reach almost 200 degrees and there's going to be a lot of, a lot of, a lot of steam coming off. 
um, and that uh, condensation gets onto your tool. Okay, so if you have an all steel handle, that can actually get slippery, and of course, that is hot lye water. All right, so you don't want that on there. Doesn't that condensation doesn't happen with a rubber handle? Okay, so rubber silicone handle is what you want with that. All right, on my I keep a little silicone spatula by as well. And I use that to scrape any lye out of the bowl in case there's any condensation in my cup. And then you want a thermometer. So you're going to want to test this solution. So my oils, which uh, we finished a few minutes ago, have heated up to 140 degrees. So they're now at 140. I've come to my lye station. Once I mix my lye into my water and my clay into my solution, uh, this is going to be about 200 degrees. And because this is less volume, um, it'll come down to about 120 at the same time my oils come down to about 120 and kind of trial and error over time I've got that figured out so 140 on my oils and the reason I take them to 140 is so all of my steric acid will uh, dissolve nicely okay so 140 there at 140 my oils we're going to mix this it's going to go to about 200 and we're going to let it settle down to um, 120 it could be between 110 to 125 all right Anything over 125, uh, if you have both of your oils and your lice water solution over 125, that's how you get what's called volcanoing. So when you mix your lye and water into your oils, if it's too hot, that stuff will try to boil up over your pot. Okay, you don't want that. So always keep both of these below 125, between 110 and 125. Now it comes with thermometers, we have two types. This is called a probe thermometer. Okay. Uh, I don't use this. Um, I probably use it for hand creams, but for this purpose I prefer um, a different type. But this probe thermometer, if you do use a probe, you want a stainless steel tip like this one, okay? And a plastic, no aluminums on it, all right? Um, this one here, you'd sit in here and of course set it and watch the temperature, all right? One option. Uh, the reason I don't like this is because you are putting it into your lye solution. You're going to have lye solution on this when you take it off. Uh, you have to clean it, neutralize it. I don't like to go through that. So what I use is what's called a point thermometer. This here's a point thermometer. I happen to get this one from Cole Palmer, the best I've found. I've gone through many. You can buy you know cheap plastic ones. Um, this one here, it, it's it's yeah, you know, it's in the seventy dollar range, but it's um, stainless steel. Um, it's solid. Uh, it comes pre-calibrated, and I've been using these things for six years, um, and the same four with no issue. I keep one at each station. They're easy to move around. You can also have what's called a gun thermometer, big ones. Uh, this one here you have to hold about a centimeter from your uh, temperature or solution that you're measuring. You can also get gun thermometers. They're pretty big and bulky. They look like a gun. You can point them from about 10 inches away, but again, I like the small ones. They're easy to move around, easy to use, and uh, I find them very convenient. Okay, um, So everything's ready to go. Got our safety gear, got my boots on my long sleeves, my vinegar, all my raw materials, and all the utensils I'm going to use. So we'll go ahead and start this process. Actually, I'm going to go put my fan on because um, I want this solution to go up and out. So just give me, I'll be back in one sec. Okay, I have my safety gear on. It's going to be a little louder. There is a uh, large exhaust fan over my head that's going to vent this, uh, uh, this exhaust and steam out of the room. <coughs> Excuse me. I have my helmet on. I use a full face shield, I prefer that, over goggles, uh, just a little safer. Uh, it's got my boots, my gloves, my long sleeves, my face mask, I'm ready to go. Um, I'm going to put uh, my lye in first, mix that up nice, you'll see it go milky white, and then turn cream, and then turn to uh, a clear. Once that's done, I'm going to put my clay in. And uh, the reason I use kaolin clay is natural soap will sometimes, especially if you're a hairy guy, uh, has a tendency to stick. Uh, the kaolin clay gives it lots of slip and glide um, and makes a real nice soap. It also draws some toxins out of the skin. So it's a great additive for your all natural um, soap. Okay, so here we go with the process. Okay, that's looking pretty good. You can still see some steam coming off. 
Uh, you want to make sure that all your lye is mixed in really well. You don't want any chunks of lye going into your soap. Okay, so I can see now, uh, looking through my measuring cup and looking on top of my measuring cup, that all my lye is well mixed. So now I'm going to go ahead and put the clay in. Okay, my clay's mixed in, and uh, it's ready to go over to our oils and uh, cool down to uh, 110 to 125 degrees. And we're going to leave our whisk in our clay, uh, lye, water solution, because the clay will settle to the bottom. Once um, I get over there, and once it uh, settles down to temperature, I'll give it a remix before we incorporate the two, uh, two different solutions, our, our lye solution and our oil solution. Take that measurement, and I'm at 188.4. So that's about right for this temperature in my room. Take my temperature. I'm at 187.6. Okay. When you do use a probe thermometer, you want to stick it in, hold it, let it go before, let the button go before you pull it away, or else you'll get a wrong reading. Okay. And my water was at room temperature when I started. Okay, so I'm going to move this over to uh, my oil station and then we're going to uh, make some soap. So I'll see you in one second. Okay, here we, ba here we are back at our cooking station. So I've uh, taken the temperature of my oils and they are now 117, which is perfect. 122, which is perfect. And just make sure our lie is the same way. Hundred and twenty three. Hundred and twenty-five one. So perfect. So our temperatures are exactly where they need to be. I've uh, got all my stuff ready, so I have my colorant. I'm putting in alkanet clay to make it purple for lavender. My teaspoon to measure it, I put one teaspoon and a quarter of alkanet in. I've got my heated oils, my heated lye solution, my stick blender. Now when it comes to stick blenders, um, I like the Cuisinarts, the reason being they're inexpensive, they last forever. They have two speeds, so you get slow and fast. But you notice the bottom, see there's ridges on the bottom, these ridges here? Uh, those are very good for uh, mixing up soap, uh, for a couple reasons, as your soap becomes thicker, it's uh, more of a uh, more work for your stick blender. Uh, I always keep a second head on hand, and then uh, I can change them out if it gets too hot. Um, and it also helps mix the thicker batter, okay? Uh, and it also doesn't suck down to the bottom of the pot. If you do use one that has a flat bottom, like this one, you'll find that it's always sucking to the bottom of the pot, okay? So I strongly recommend you get a stick blender with ridges, two speeds, you want them between 250 and you know 300 watts. Uh, that's uh, that's a good strength. But you also want ones that have a button that detract the head from the motor. Okay. And the reason being is you have to change them out. You can do that easily. Keep the same uh, base in in your soap. Uh, and the other reason is is they don't come apart. Okay. So when they're together, they're together. Uh, the ones that twist together as your soap batter gets thicker and as it moves around in your soap they come apart so I've watched a lot of soap videos where their blender is always coming apart and I'm like really get a proper blender so Cuisinart is a good one um, it's the one I prefer been using these for years all the features that you want right so that's what you want with that alright so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put my colorant in and each pot's going to get a teaspoon and a quarter ish now, of course, you can color to your preference. I like a little deeper purple on my lavender soap, so I give it a good, uh, a pretty good shot of alkanet powder. So, about a teaspoon and a quarter. Okay, set that aside. So my teaspoon can get cleaned and put my alkanet powder away. Alright, so first thing I'll do is I'll simply 
Mix up the oils, make sure they're blended well. You're going to hear some noise here, obviously. Uh, and then we'll get to the lye solution. I'll bring this just a little closer. Hopefully you can see it a little better. It's a little dark. So if you can't see that, that is now a nice purple. Okay. Alright, move over to the next pot. Just give that a mix. Okay, good to go. Okay, now, we've got to make sure we've got our safety gear on. So I've got my, my uh, rubber gloves on here. I've got my boots on, I've got my helmet, my long sleeves, and I'm going to take this to trace. Now, when you mix your lye with your oils, uh, you want to pour it on your stick blender here so you don't get any splashing. That works out fine. You always want to keep your stick blender in the pot uh, when you have it running so you're not splashing uh, lye all over the place. You want to have your vinegar solution ready in case you do uh, spill anything, all right? And then your eyewash station, of course, okay? So when I mix this lye in, uh, uh, using a stick blender, it'll go to what's called trace in about two minutes, uh, up to five minutes, depending on how hot your oils are, okay? Um, if you, uh, so what's happening when you're taking it to trace, you're, you're mixing your oils, your butters, uh, and your lye water solution together, it's going through a process called saponification, and that's actually making soap. And what's happening is all of your uh, oils are fatty acids and plant matter. And a fatty acid is one molecule, a picture of um, a capital E. It's one molecule of glycerin bound by three molecules of fatty acid. Okay? Uh, those can, the fatty acids can be stearic acid, palmitic acid, I mean all the different types of acids. Each fatty acid imparts a different characteristic to your soap. And you can learn about that if you want to watch the uh, recipe making tutorial. You can find that down below. Um, when it goes through saponification, what happens is those fatty acids, that three chain molecule, the glycerin separates from the fatty acids. And it goes through saponification is a technical term. But what it's really doing is it's becoming a crystallized salt, right? So it's a crystallized salt it, as, it, as it goes through the saponification process. It consumes the lye, and what you're left with is crystallized salts of your fatty acids and glycerin. And as we cook, you'll see that glycerin separate out. We'll mix that back in uh, to make a real nice bar of soap. So that's kind of what's happening as we go through this. But let's go ahead and take this to trace. There's three levels of trace, light trace, medium trace, and heavy trace. A light trace, when you run your stick blender, and I'm going to bring this close so you can actually watch this process. It's a little shaky, hopefully it's okay. So if you draw your stick blender up like this, a light trace, uh, it'll just settle right back down in. On a medium trace, it'll stay up on top, a ridge will stay up on top for you know, a little bit and then settle back in. On a heavy trace, uh, it'll just stay, uh, so a ridge will stay. So we're looking for that ridge to stay. A couple reasons why I like to take the heavy trace on hot process is because um, I'm putting clay in here and clay, and I've already mixed this back up again, but separates down to the bottom when you mix it with your water and lye. You don't want that same thing happening in your soap. So the thicker, when you go to a thick trace, it holds those clay particles in within the soap without it settling back down to the bottom of the soap. So it's nice to go to a thick trace. If we were doing a cold process soap, you would simply be mixing this oil, your oils, with your lye in a pot rather than a crock pot, okay? So we're going to go ahead and bring this, these two pots to thick trace. It's going to get a little noisy.
So I was just wiping up the live drip and setting that aside for cleaning. Now you'll notice our soap's looking a little gray in color. So what happens is when you mix your Elkadep powder with the water live solution, it turns it gray. What'll happen is it goes through the sponification process and as it cooks, uh, it's gonna turn that back into a purple, okay? All right. So I like to mix it up a little bit, let it sit and rest for a little bit. Uh, when you're adding colorants, I like to use um, ground seed powders. Uh, they're the easiest to mix in. Um, you know, they give you a, a fairly vibrant color. So I use Alkanet for purple. I use Matter Root powder for pink. I'll use Anato ground Anato seed. Uh, a little bit will give you yellow. A lot will give you um, a nice bright orange. Uh, so there's many ways to make your colors, um, so I, I prefer uh, the powdered seeds, they're 100% natural, there's no um, controversy over them, so, you know, some of the oxides, people will, you know, they, they don't like that as natural, uh, because, you know, certainly the oxide's natural, but extracting it uh, goes through a lab process to do that, and um, some chemicals, so folks don't like that, so you want 100% natural, um, you're best to go with uh, ground uh, uh, seed. Uh, or nut powders. Um, some you can't mix with lye, uh, they'll just turn brown. Um, if that's the case, you want to add your colorant after your soap's cooked and there's no more lye in it. Um, other things you can do is you can take botanicals, like for example, a, um, a nettle uh, or a sage leaf, and you can infuse that in your oil, uh, simmer it lightly on the stove, or you know, set it aside for a couple days, uh, and that can also be used for colorants. Um, but I do prefer the ground seeds, okay? And you're, no, you're, you're in no hurry here. It's just, uh, you know, let it work its thing, let it do its thing, let it go through its chemical process. You can see now that, you know, I'm almost at a, at a heavy trace, so when I make a ridge, that ridge is pretty well staying there. Shake it a little bit. So I'm, I'm pretty well at heavy trace, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it just a little more. So you definitely want to make sure that you take it to the to, to good trace. You see when I put that ridge up there, it just stays there. It, I can't even shake it down. It's not going anywhere. So that's a good heavy trace. Uh, if you do work with light trace, um, you need to be cautious that you don't get what's called a false trace because your, your, your water lye solution is not actually going through that chemical metamorphosis um, with, your, with your oils and butters. So you want to make sure you're at trace. So that's a good heavy trace. I'm going to set that there for a second. And then I'm just gonna move my blender right over to this one because now we're gonna do our second pot. So what I do at this point is I take my spatula. Now remember, everything you, you work with now until it's cooked is chemically hot. So you wanna keep everything separate, distinct. Uh, and when I finish with a, a tool, a spatula, a whisk, a measuring cup, I'll spritz that with vinegar and then wash it out, okay? So I just wanna take this off the edge of my pot. Now, at this point in time, a lot of people will just put the lid back on. I don't do that. And the reason being is when you put uh, your lid back on here, I'll just grab my lid, and you seal that up, a whole bunch of condensation is gonna get on top of your lid here, so it's all gonna be full of beaded water. And then every time you pull that off, that's dripping, every, you get, there's really not much you can do with that. You're gonna, you're gonna get chemically hot water uh, splashed around. So I, I discard the lid at this point in time. I don't discard it, but I put it aside. 
I got a little trick I use which I'll show you. So what I like to use is plastic wrap uh, and it works great. So I take some plastic wrap and I put that over the top of the pot like this and what that does is that keeps the heat in. I pull it tight, make sure it's on there really good. All right, so it doesn't build as much condensation for some reason, I think because it's thinner. Uh, and uh, you can see your soap, you can see what's happening with your soap. It, it will build some. Uh, I give that a little bit of a pressure relief, so I put three holes in it. So you are going to get, if you make those holes too big, you can just put plastic over it, it's fine. And that way, it gets a little bit of uh, steam release. Now, that's going to sit there and cook for one hour. And after uh, the hour, we're going to come and take a look at it, and it's going it's, to, we're going to stir it up, and then we're going to let it cook for another half an hour. Uh, some people will let their soap cook for the whole period until it's done. I don't like to do that because crock pots obviously cook from the outside to the center. So the center is always a little cooler than where your soap is at the edges or on the bottom. So I like to mix that up to make sure everything's getting cooked properly. Um, it, it, it's a good habit to get into. I do just stir once at the one hour period. So I'm going to leave this here for you to watch and I'm going to time lapse the video so it'll go quickly. So this hour will go you know, in a minute. Uh, but you'll see it kind of start to curl up in the sides. Right? Uh, you'll see the glycerin start to pool in the center uh, and you'll see it getting a good cook. And then uh, once our hour's up, uh, I'll come and we'll give it a stir and then we'll cook it for another half an hour. Okay, I'm back. Um, at this point, our soap is cooked for one hour. I can see you've had a nice rolling of the soap over to the center. I don't know if you can see that in the camera or not. A little hard through the plastic. Um, I'm going to take this off in a second. Uh, no longer need our gloves because this soap is no longer chemically hot to burn you. Uh, so it won't burn you at this point. Uh, almost completely saponified. Uh, you can see, well, I'll take this off now. Just fold that in on itself, nice and neat. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see this or not. Actually, go through my spoons first. So I'm back to silicone spoons. I'm going to stir with the silicone spoon. Now there's two types of silicone spoons you can use. Um, this one here has no ridge down it, and it's quite flexible. Okay. Um, this soap is going to be thicker now and tougher to stir. So now I move to a silicone spoon that actually has a a ridge. And this is. Um, a piece of metal inside this spoon okay so now this one is extremely more it's more rigid than this this one here okay so uh, I, I moved to a more rigid spoon for this process now you should be able to see in the center here this here that's our glycerin that's separated so we, we told you it's going through a process of saponification so the glycerin is separating from the fatty acids and that's what all this liquid is in the center. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to mix all that liquid back in. So we're going to give this a quick stir. Uh, it's been one hour. Uh, during that hour I've cleaned up my work surface, cleaned all my utensils and measuring cups and spoons and everything else. And I'm completely ready and clean now for the next step. So our next step is to simply stir this. I'm going to put some plastic wrap back on it, let it cook for another half an hour and it's going to be done and we'll test that when that half an hour goes by. Um, I won't continue uh, rolling the video uh, once we get this uh, stirred up and, and ready to go again. Uh, this pot's quite hot. You see that nice purple coming up there now. So you probably want to have a oven mitt. I use these little ones, don't like the big ones. So I just hold my pot and then I can stir the center into the outsides and the outsides in the center. So I'm going to give a real good stir in this. I'm keeping the camera close just so you can see the process. So I stir that in good. And I scrape my sides down just to make sure everything's moving into the center. Have that, the hot stuff into the center. Okay. So now I've got a nice deep purple. 
And this purple will lighten as it cools once we get to that phase there. Okay, so that soap is now nicely stirred and it is ready for another half an hour cook. So we'll get our plastic wrap. You don't want to lose too much heat, so you want to put this back on for its final stages. Let's get that on nice and tight. Okay, that is good. Give us some holes. Okay, so one half an hour and we're good. Um, I'm going to turn the video off at this point in time, stir my second pot, and uh, next frame we'll be back to take our soap off the pot. And uh, then we're going to look at getting our uh, molds ready. And we'll go through that process. Okay, see you in a second. Okay, so our soap has finished cooking. It cooked for an hour and then a half an hour after a stir at an hour. So pots are behind me. I don't know if you can see them, but pot one, pot two. Uh, so after one and a half hours, I've removed them from the crock pot. Don't forget to turn your crock pot off. And now they're going to cool. I'm going to let them cool between 140 and 145 degrees. And right now they're about 180. And the reason being is you want to put your essential oils in when it's cooled down so you don't burn that oil off or damage any of their therapeutic properties. So while that's cooling, we're going to get our dyes ready. Um, so uh, you can buy dyes on Amazon. You can buy them from soap making supply companies. I didn't like anything you could buy, so um, I made my own. So what I have is basically two side pieces with grooves I cut in, and then holes to put them together, a bottom piece, and two end pieces. So five pieces, then I have seven six inch long by five sixteenths um, leg bolts, right? And that's it. And um, I, if you look down in the, um, uh, below the video, uh, in, in uh, uh, the text below there, uh, if you open that up or expand it, you'll find um, a link to the dimensions of these molds I've made here. Uh, but uh, really great molds, they're breakaway molds. This is the first time I've had them apart in you know, it's been uh, six years. Uh, this is what a mold actually looks like, right? So nice and solid, sturdy, uh, yet you can get your soap out very easily. And that's the problem most people have is getting their soap out. So I'll just assemble this die. So I simply sit, sit, sit these two guys up here. Move this bottom aside for now. And this won't take very long at all. So that goes in. In, that goes in. I'm basically putting my lag bolts through my holes. Then I'm going to go ahead and put on my wing nuts. So these are 5 16 wing nuts. Like I said once I have these made, I've never had to take them apart because I line them, which I'm going to show you in a second, and uh, you just have to loosen your leg bolts off to uh, to get your soap uh, soap out. So we've got five of these, six of these, seven of these. Come on. That's a stubborn one there. Okay. Okay, so once I have those on, I can just separate this like that. Now the bottom piece, so you notice in the bottom, you've got one, two, three, that holds your bottom piece in, and then these two end ones keep your bottom piece from moving, okay? So when I put my bottom in, it simply goes like that. Tighten these up just a little bit. Okay, 
perfect. So now, the bottom piece, the bottom legs, keep this from moving, yet I still have access to take it out if I want to take it out. Okay? And then these side pieces, I've cut grooves into each side. I don't know if you can see those. Side pieces simply go into the grooves. Like that. And then once you... Like that. Now once you tighten your leg bolts down, it puts pressure on both the side pieces and the bottom piece. And nothing moves. So there you go. One solid piece of mold. It's perfect. Uh, this is for 16 bars of soap. So it's 16 and a quarter inches long. My soap's one inches per bar. And the extra quarter of an inch is for your cutoffs at your end because you want to make your soap look nice and pretty. All right? And then it's um, three inches wide by two inches high is the end size of my soap bars. So they're two by three uh, by um, 16 bars. I end up getting 18 bars because with my cutoffs, I rebatch those into a couple, um, uh, a couple more bars. So here's my second mold because we've done two batches. So I just make sure my wing nuts are, wing nuts are tight, which they are. And I'm going to line it. Okay. Ready to line it is I use freezer paper and I've cut two pieces for the end. Freezer paper is matte on one side, glossy on the other side. And I use painter's tape. Okay. So what I do is I simply fold a little quick fold here. I put it in the edge of the die and I fold it over. Take a piece of painter's tape and tape it in. Done. And I do the other side. Little fold, maybe a quarter inch, a little over a quarter of an inch. Fold it around the corner, and pieces are in. The reason I do this is because I've used a composite material here, and I actually cut it out with a, um, um, a desktop three-dimensional milling machine, but you can make this out of wood. Uh, but you want to line them, because when I line them, I simply pull my paper out with my soap in it, and, and I've cut little squares that will fit on the bottom of both sides. I just push that down. Didn't take that guy very good, I guess. So I push that down to the bottom, put a crease, bottom, put a crease. I'm just using my, my nails for that. I fold the side over and I tape it. I'm just going to give that a clean. So I'm having tapes have a little trouble sticking, which means I just need a clean. There we go. So when you build a mold, or buy a mold, and you line it, if you can get your soap out without having to do any damage um, to your mold, or getting it dirty, um, you can simply put it on the shelf and it's ready to go again next time. Right. Okay. This guy down a little better. Go ahead and do this side. And I usually like to get my molds ready while my soap is cooling, just before I add my essential oils. That's all there is to it. So that mold now is lined and ready for soap. And then because there's no lye left in there, I always give it just a spritz of isopropyl alcohol. Set this one aside. And then I'm going to go ahead and make my second one up. I will note that uh, when my soap was cooking, 
I did go ahead and get my lavender essential oil ready. So I measured out 50 grams, and that's how much I put into uh, an 18 batch bar of soap. Um, so I have two 50 milliliter uh, lavender essential oils uh, ready to go, and that'll get mixed into my soap uh, batch as soon as it cools to between 140 and 145 degrees. Uh, some people are tempted to put in a little hotter. Don't do it. You'll actually see uh, your oils burning off. So you want to keep it about that temperature. Okay, so we'll be back in a sec to actually put our soap, put our essential oil into our soap and mold it up. Okay, here we are for the final step. So our soap is now exactly 140 degrees. Just confirm that. 140 degrees. So that's a perfect temperature to go ahead and put in our essential oil. So I've got our essential oil here. I've measured out 50 grams of lavender pure essential oil. Simply make a little pocket in the center. I dump that in. And then give it a really good stir. Kind of move it around a little bit. You're going to see some steam come off here, but that's okay. Okay, so I do use 50 grams, and I do know I lose a little bit in this process. So it uh, probably ends up with about 47, 48 grams by the time you're done. So mix that up really good. And then you've got one beautiful, my goodness, that smells wonderful. Oh, can't wait for a shower. <laughs> okay, so after that's mixed up really good, you'll see I've got a nice deep purple color here now. And that's going to lighten up as it cools. So now I simply scrape my sides best I can, make sure my spoon's clean. Now cold, a uh, hot process soap is a little more rustic than cold process. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's like mashed potatoes is what this should look like, albeit purple mashed potatoes. I'm just going to start molding it. So what I do is I put a layer in and then I slam it. And what that does is that gets all the bubbles out uh, and your soap is nice, uh, nice solid bars, what you want. Uh, if I was doing cold process soap, at this point, uh, once I brought my soap to trace in its pot, I would have simply dumped it in the mold uh, right now instead of cooking it and then set it aside for five to six weeks to go through that saponification process on its own nice and slow. Um, uh, both have their advantages, so I like the hot process method better for the reason being is that uh, you're not um, damaging your essential oils at all. So they're not heating up past that 140 degrees that this soap is. I'm going to turn the video down just for a second. This is noisy. And then back up. That uh, that's going to get air bubbles out and give you nice solid bars with no holes in them. So you want to give it a nice, uh, nice couple of shots. I usually get about eight. Uh, so hot process soap, you're not damaging your um, essential oils at all. And you can add colorants uh, to it once it's actually cooked if you want um, that do get damaged by lye. So, uh, you know, if you want a, you know, an indigo soap or something like that, you can use some of the other, uh, the other herbs that uh, uh, generally can't be exposed to lye. Um, when you're cooking cold process soap, uh, your essential oil has to go in um, at the, as soon as you get it saponified. Uh, and then that soap, when it hits the mold, is going to heat up to over 200 degrees and stay there for quite some time, like a day-ish. And it's going, to, uh, it's going to do some damage to those essential oils. So you're going to lose some of your scent, some of your therapeutic value. Um, however, it's, it's still fine, it still smells good. Uh, but you do need to put a little more essential oil into a cold process um, soap, just because you do do some damage to the scent. So that's uh, one of the reasons I like hot process better. And the second reason is, is I would like to make my soap and sell it uh, within a week. Whereas on a, a batch of uh, cold process soap, a year at least five to six weeks before your soap can hit the market. So, you know, if your business is growing, you're going crazy, having trouble keeping up, uh, you certainly don't want to be waiting 
six plus weeks to um, get yourself to market. Uh, once I get this phase done, okay, volume down again. Okay, then I give it a spritz of Isopro, simply because I want to make sure nothing got introduced to it or gets introduced to it. If you're doing cold process soap, you definitely want to spritz it because Isopro inhibits soda ash, which you do get in cold process soap uh, when it's curing. I put some of my plastic wrap over it. Got it. Pack her down into that mold again. So I said I like nice dense bars. All right, and there we go. We have one mold, 18 bars will be, of lavender, all natural soap. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do my second mold quickly. Now, a couple things you wanna keep in mind when you are making soap. You certainly don't want any children or pets in the vicinity of your soap making. Uh, the reason being, of course, is you have uh, caustic soda or lye. Um, it's also called pearl ash. Uh, you don't want that stuff, uh, although it's safe if handled properly, uh, you don't want that stuff anywhere near uh, your kids um, or your pets. So that's important. Um, the other important thing to know is that any utensils or uh, crock pots or blenders stick blenders, measuring cups, it doesn't matter what it is, that you use for your soap making process should um, be dedicated now to soap. Uh, you don't want to put, put that stuff back in your kitchen. So never use any of your kitchen utensils um, to make soap. And the reason for that is because you're dealing with lye, uh, you don't want to make the mistake of not having something cleaned and then going ahead and putting food in that and then ingesting lye because that's not going to go well for you or anybody that uh, that that partakes in that. So you want to be really cautious. Um, uh, responsible, I guess, would be the right word when you make it soap. So uh, you are dealing with some uh, some caustic chemicals, and you do want those things to not be contaminating anything else uh, uh, that you're uh, getting involved in. Um, if you did like our video today, um, it would be absolutely great if you could subscribe to our channel and. Uh, you do that just by looking below and there's a little subscribe button. You can uh, click that. Uh, really appreciate it if you can do that for us. That helps me out make more content. Uh, there's also a like and share button. If you do like it, maybe hit that thumbs up. And uh, if you don't like it, well, just don't hit anything. <laughs> and then there's also a little bell there. And that little bell will, uh, once you subscribe, give you notifications of future videos that I do uh, produce. So right now, if you look at the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the video, you'll see some companion videos to this one. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, a blueprint for the mold. Um, uh, a couple other videos which we talked about through uh, today's soap making process. Uh, but uh, I'm also going to be uh, producing a couple of videos uh, in the near future. And if you hit that subscribe and notification button, you'll, you'll know when they come out. But uh, I'm going to make a video on making um, uh, deodorant. We also do uh, all natural deodorant at Lifejevity Soap Company. And uh, volume down for a second. And we make uh, shampoo bars. We're going to teach you how to do that, uh, which is one of our best selling products today. Uh, we make lip balms. I'm going to show you how to do that on a video. And uh, hand cream. We make the nicest hand cream in the known universe, non-greasy, aloe-based hand cream, which is just phenomenal. And we'll teach you how to make that. And then we do uh, linen spray. Teach you how to do some linen sprays. And basically, we're going to run through our whole catalog and teach you how to make the stuff we make. Uh, this video is the companion video to our book that I wrote, which is called So You Want to Be a Soap Maker. And that's what that book looks like here. And you can find that link down the bottom as well. And uh, in that book, um, it's really an in-depth book going through everything we talked about today. But it really uh, talks about um, starting a business and what kind of business do you want to start. Is it a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an LLC, um, an incorporation? So we go through all that and those options. Uh, we go through 
um, of course making your product, uh, packaging and labeling, um, marketing, uh, all that. All, all, we get really in depth on everything involved in being a soap maker. So if you, your dream is to start an artisan skincare company making soap and uh, turning that, that dream into a six figure plus income, I'll kind of walk you through the steps on how to achieve that and that um, that might be enjoyable for you if that's the route you want to go down so uh, you can find that link below as well now although this isn't the end of the video um, it is the end of today's portion because what has to happen now is this soap is going to set up in these molds overnight and then I'm going to come back in the morning and show you how I unmold them cut them trim them and stamp them and uh, for this video purpose that'll come up in the next frame but for my purpose it'll be tomorrow morning there there is mold number two so two beautiful perfect molds of lavender all natural soap all right so i'll see you in a few seconds to unmold this cut it trim it up all right see you in a bit Okay, uh, here we are the next morning, and uh, when we were uh, gone, um, this soap, uh, two beautiful slabs of lavender, all natural uh, soap has cured, and we're going to cut it up this morning. Now, a couple things I did is I went, of course, and cleaned up all my crock pots and all my utensils. Everything is now uh, in its place and put away. Uh, so this morning, uh, oh, what I did is I um, took my pots and I scraped the edges with this simple plastic scraper and came up with these two what I call soap gloves. So this is from the edges of the pot. Still, mmm, smells wonderful. It's perfect soap. Because we're cooking hot process, this soap is ready to use right now. I could go up to my shower, take a bar, and have a nice lavender shower. So uh, it's ready to go. If this was hot process, uh, these molds, or sorry, if it was cold process, we would be setting these molds aside for about five, six weeks to cure. As it goes slowly goes through the saponification process, then we'd cut it. So one of the differences between hot and cold is cold, you got about six weeks before you can use it or sell it. Hot, I could sell this tomorrow. Now I do cut it and set it aside for about a week. Uh, so a little bit of water will still cure out of it to about eight to 10%. So I cut it a little big on weight to allow that curing to happen. And I sell my bars at 125 grams each, so I cut them about 135 to 140 grams, and a week from now they'll be about my 125. Now, these soap globs, a couple things you can do with them. Uh, what we did with them, either take them up to your shower. Uh, we also uh, bagged them up and sold them at our markets as soap globs. A couple bucks a pop, people ate them up. Uh, the other thing you can do is rebatch them. So as we go through cutting our soap this morning, we're going to end up with some cutoffs and some trimmings. Um, we save those cutoffs and trimmings and melt it back down. And uh, doing that uh, gives you uh, about another um, uh, four to six bars, depending on how you cut them. So uh, we're going to cut uh, 16 out of this mold, 16 out of this one for 32 bars. We'll end up with about uh, you know 38 uh, bars when we're finished. Uh, throw our um, our soap gloves in. Uh, it's about a 40 bar cook in total. So I'm going to save these, and we're going to rebatch those. Um, how we rebatch is after we collect all our cuttings. I simply put them in a freezer bag, and then I seal that up and take the air out. I microwave it for about 40 seconds. Uh, it makes it nice and soft again, and then I mold it in this mold I made. So this simply goes in the counter and the hot soap gets pushed into these molds with my plastic spatula. And this is uh, one inch by three inches by two inches. So when I fill this up with soap for my rebatching, um, I get perfect size bars. And I do sell my bars one inch wide by three inches by two inches. So a little mold I made just out of HDPE, uh, which is plastic and one inch um, tubing so that works great for rebatching uh, waste not why not so uh, if i get another you know say eight bars out of here you know i sell my soap for uh, six bucks a bar uh, seven bucks for goat's milk eight bucks for organic 
another 50 to 60 bucks just out of doing your rebatching so you want to do that for sure okay uh, when I um, cut my soap and trim it I put it in one of these little trays here uh, these are stackable trays I can stack them as tall as I am uh, and it's perfect for curing your soap it's got holes in the bottom uh, and then the sides for stacking so it's a great system so I do use these trays here and then when I set my soap aside, they just sit in those trays. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and first unmold, uh, and then we'll get into uh, how we're going to cut and some of the options you can use for cutting and trimming. All right, so let's do this quickly. Now, I did want to mention a few things. Um, yesterday, uh, when I did put, just before I put my soap in my mold, um, I did forget to mention that I tested this to make sure it wasn't hot or that there was no lye in it. And if you got your measurements correct, on your oils and on your lye, uh, that will never be an issue. Uh, but if you made a mistake or you had a bad scale because of batteries or it's out of calibration, um, you do want to test it. And how I test it is I take a little wee um, bit of soap out of the pot just before um, I take it off the heat and I smear that on a paper towel and then I Put uh, two drops of phenylephthalene, and I don't quite know how to spell that, so I'll put the name up here with a bottle. Um, and this tests for um, how how much uh, alkaline is in your soap. So uh, if you have um, you know bright pink when you do that, um, it's lye heavy. Um, if you have a light pink, it's usually around you know 10.5 to 11. Um, um, and if you have uh, uh, no color whatsoever, you know your soap has been cured. It doesn't tell you exactly what your pH is, uh, but it gives you a range. So um, if you have no color whatsoever, no pink whatsoever, you're in a range of about 8 to 9.5, which is perfect for all natural soap. So you do always want to test each batch, okay? Um, so all right, so let's, uh, oh, when you're at this point, you always want to wear your gloves because your customers, I'm sure, don't want you pawn their soap, okay? So we're going to work on finished bars now. So when I mold this, I simply give my uh, wind nuts a little untwist, and then bring my tape up on each side, and do the edges. And the edges. And presto ramo. As easy as that, we have one. One beautiful slab of lavender. All natural. Wonderful stuff, smelling soap. And I just discard the freezer paper, and there you go. One big, wonderful block of soap. Once uh, one of my sisters, as a joke, uh, took this whole slab home for their kids and put it in the shower. <laughs> you can certainly do that. Set that one aside. And we'll do number two. Now, if you're doing hot process soap, uh, there's a couple couple things you, you want to try and uh, keep in mind. If, uh, if you're using crock pots, which is, in my opinion, the best by far way to make it, uh, you want to use the same, if, you, if you're going to do more than one cook at a time, meaning using more than one crock pot, you're absolutely going to want to have um, uh, the same type of pots. And the reason being, uh, you, you know, if you're cooking to cook four pots at the same time, uh, once you uh, clean those pots up and uh, go to put them back into their uh, into their heating elements, um, you don't want to have to be trying to figure out what pot goes into what bowl. So you want to have the same kind of pots. And that just makes your life easier when it comes to cleanup. Um, you also want to make sure that anything that touched lye uh, or um, uh, maybe had some lye spray on it, you want to make sure that you use your vinegar solution to uh, neutralize that lye uh, before you wash it up as well and that's uh, that's going to keep you from getting any chemical burns or anybody else in the area okay second beautiful bar of all natural lavender soap oh that smells so wonderful all right I set that aside okay now when it comes to cutting this soap you have a couple options um, 
yeah, the cheapest, easiest um, option is to cut it by hand simply using uh, this is um, a large six inch putty knife, right? So you can certainly take your block, and I cut my soap one inch, so my bars are three inches by two inches by one inch. You know, you can certainly kind of put a ruler on there and push just straight through. Uh, you know, that's the cheapest, easiest way to cut soap. But if, you, if you're making a lot of soap, that's going to take a heck of a long time to do. Uh, your other option is to uh, use a miter box, and it's a, a miter box is a wooden box or plastic box with holes in it people use to saw 45 and angles and stuff. You can put it in a miter box and then run this down those holes to cut your soap. That's an option. You can also get one-off bar cutters, uh, which are wire cutters. I'll show you a picture of those here. <coughs> Excuse me. Bar cutters uh, work better, um, easier, a nice clean cut. However, cutting one bar at a time, uh, that could become tedious as well and take you quite some time. What I, uh, my preference is to use a wire cutter um, that will cut the whole loaf at the same time. And I'll show you what that cutter looks like now. So this is the one I use. So what this is, is a uh, plastic base, metal. Um, this has wires on it here. Comes down like this. Okay. So when I lift this up, like that, I don't know if you can see in the camera, but these are wires. Um, I just use uh, guitar strings as replacement wires. Okay, there's grooves in this plastic, so the wires go right through. Okay, and it's and the reason I made the mold size uh, the size I did is because it fits my bar of soap. All right, so what I do is I put my slab of soap in there. And I let it overhang a little bit on each side. Okay, these are the cutoffs. Okay, and then simply push it down. I just want to keep a nice, even pressure on it, and that's going to cut that soap evenly, and it's going to look absolutely spectacular. So when I bring that down, these are my cutoffs. I put them into my rebatching bag. They're going to get made into new soap, and then here's my 16 bars of one-inch soap. So when I pull that off, there you go. A nice pretty bar of lavender soap. Okay, and then I'm going to trim up all these edges and make it look real pretty. Now some um, uh, novelty soap makers will leave these ridges on, okay, um, square them up a bit and package them like that. I prefer to cut mine nice and square at two inches by three inches, wrap it up 100% uh, and that makes a real nice bar of soap. Yeah, you'll see a lot of artisan soap makers um, and you know, don't worry about the hate mail, you haters out there when I say this, but you know, they'll just put a cardboard sleeve around here and the soap will be exposed to the environment when they're at markets. Soap is a humectant, which means it absorbs everything around it, um, which includes the dirt, the dust, uh, people sneezing and coughing, uh, people touching it. Um, no thank you. So um, I always make sure my soap is uh, completely wrapped up. And if you want to see um, I'm not going to, once we get this cut and trimmed today, I'm not going to wrap it because I'm going to let it cure for a week. Uh, I will put a video link in the bottom as well, uh, down below, uh, of uh, my packaging process. So if you do want to see that, um, once you're finished here today, uh, go ahead and click that link. And then uh, I do just give my wires a little clean just to get any extra pieces of soap off there so I'm not transferring that to my second bars because you want them to look nice and clean and professional. So I'll give those wires a little clean. That's done. And now I'm going to cut my second loaf. Okay, we're done with our cutter. Oh, I'm going to clean that off for next time. If you don't clean this off, uh, what will happen is this soap, as it uh, cures a little bit and hardens up, will harden up really hard in these wires and then you'll be uh, kind of cursing yourself for not uh, having that nice and clean. And uh, when you're making soap, uh, pardon the pun, but cleanliness is next to godliness. Okay. Actually, cleanliness is next to godliness. Um, you actually won't find that in the Bible, I looked. It's not there. That's a man thing. 
All right, we're going to set this aside. Okay. Now you have all these wonderful, beautiful uh, lavender soap bars. And I said I like to make mine nice and square. So there's a, a way I do that. And what I've done is I've made myself a little uh, die cutter, you'll call it, or a mold, I guess, uh, which looks like this. So this bar here is three inches by two and a quarter inches, or by two inches, and then I cut it just a little big to allow for curing. So and I should probably set this aside so you can see what I'm doing here. So now, next process, and I'm going to go through this quickly once I start. I'll put my soap in here, push it in tight, cut it off. And this is going to go for rebatching. And there's one bar cut nice and neat. So I go through that for each one of my bars. And once you, you get pretty efficient at this as you start going along. like that so for all 32 bars I'm just going to give them a quick trim and now they are two by three or three in just a little bit so I'll uh, speed this process up as I go through this Okay, once I've done my initial cut in my bars, uh, then I like to trim the edges. So I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera, but the edges are, you know, they need some work. So uh, I've tried a whole bunch of ways to do that. I mean, you can buy edge peelers from soap supply companies, which I have. Um, yeah, they're okay. They don't work great. Um, I've tried with little, uh, you know, ceramic knives breaking the tip off to use as a peeler. Tried that. Um, doesn't work so good. Uh, and I tried carrot, carrot peelers and uh, you can buy a whole bunch of carrot peelers and that's what I do use. Um, uh, you don't want to buy ones that have non-fixed cutting heads on them. Okay, That's just a pain. You can't get it even. Um, you don't want ones with heads that rotate. They're simply no good. So don't use that if you're going to trim your soap. Right? What's absolutely best and simple, costs a couple bucks, is an old-fashioned carrot peeler. I like to use one with the rubber handle around, it's more comfortable, but a fixed head, okay? So soap's not going to get jammed up behind it, uh, easy to clean, uh, very simple, all right? So then what I simply do is I simply trim all the edges of my soap to make it look nice and pretty. And you get real good at this after a while. So I just trim up the edges like this, all four corners, flip it around, and do these four edges, all right? So I do that for every single bar doesn't take more than a couple minutes. I put my cutoffs into my rebatching bag so they are ready to go uh, on, on the rebatch to make my extra six to eight bars. Okay, And then when you do that um, you get a real nice clean bar of soap. Your edges are clean and then when people roll that in their hands to start they don't have an, a sharp corner. So that's the only reason I do it. It just makes it look a little better and I said I kind of like to have a professional looking bar. So uh, that works out really good. Uh, you will notice that on the hot process cook here, uh, which we've done, uh, your bars look a little rustic and I think that's absolutely great for a handmade um, artisan soap. So I like that. Um, some people do, uh, some people don't, but our customers love it. Uh, we like it. It's just a real nice rustic looking bar of wonderful smelling soap. Now, uh, if you, uh, I want to talk about substitutions a little bit. So, you know, if you do want to make soap at home or you're aspiring to be a soap maker to start a business, uh, you got to start somewhere. And, you know, it might be hard to find some of the ingredients that um, I use in my soaps uh, right off the bat. So, for example, stearic acid, which I use to make my bars um, a little harder. Uh, if you can't find that material, um, you know, you can get it at soap making supply companies, of course. Uh, you can get it at Amazon as well. Uh, but if you want something simple just to start, um, you can replace that with salt. So instead of putting stearic acid in, you can put in a tablespoon of salt uh, into a soap cook about the size we did here. And uh, that will harden your bars up as well. Uh, and don't forget, when your soap actually goes through the saponification process, 
it is actually a crystallized salt. So salt's not going to hurt your soap in the least bit or dry skin out because you got a lot of nice oils in there. Uh, so you can use salt. Um, when it comes to the clay, um, I, I like to use kaolin clay because it is a pure white clay. And when I'm making soaps that I don't color, um, it helps to uh, keep those soaps a really nice, vibrant, uh, uh, light white or cream. Uh, you know, I don't want to be using a, a green clay, for example, or a yellow clay in a white soap. So I simply use kaolin clay. Uh, it's a real great clay for slip and glide. Uh, and um, you can use it in all your soaps without affecting your color. And so that you do color, well, it doesn't affect those because it's white. So um, it's absolutely fine. Um, if you don't have kaolin clay or can't find it, and you happen to live in an area that has uh, clay in the ground, you can just take a, a couple, couple tablespoons uh, right out of the backyard and melt that into your soap pot, and that'll work just as well, believe it or not. Um, it won't give you the nice white color, uh, but it will actually work. If I wanted to turn this lavender soap into, let's say, um, uh, a Lang Lang soap, um, I would have simply made two substitutions. Oh, and I did want to mention steric acid. Um, if you do happen to replace that with um, salt, uh, you have to run the recipe through a soap calculator again because st uh, steric acid is actually part of the saponification process. So you would change uh, your ratio of oils to lye. So you would absolutely have to run it through a soap calculator uh, without having um, that steric acid in there. Um, and if you do want to, I think I mentioned earlier, but if you do want to uh, actually go and uh, play with some recipes yourself, um, I do have a video link uh, down below that teaches you how to do that. Uh, so if you want to make or design your own soap or make different size batches of soap, um, go ahead and check that video link out and you will be able to design and make your own soap. Now if I want to change this soap, uh, and this is my base recipe, I have uh, two main base recipes, this one and then a premium one which I replace the palm oil uh, with um, some shea butter and, and different butters and oils. Um, uh, but this, this here, uh, my base recipe, if I wanted to change this into, say, a Lang Lang soap, I would have simply have substituted the um, alkanet clay with um, matter root. I'm um, oh, sorry, the alkanet powder uh, with matter root powder, which would have turned this soap pink instead of purple, a real nice light pink. Um, and I would have substituted my lavender essential oil with um, Lang Lang essential oil. And then uh, you don't have to change uh, your recipe at all because those are simply additives. They don't affect the saponification process. And this would have been a pretty uh, nice smelling Lang Lang soap. If you wanted to make a spearmint soap, for example, I would have replaced my alkanet powder with a kelp powder uh, and a bit of sage powder and simply scented it with uh, spearmint essential oil instead of uh, lavender essential oil. And that would have given me a nice, um, you know, light green uh, bar of soap that smells like spearmint, which is just an absolutely spectacular soap. So um, this is a base recipe. You can play around with that, and you can come up with as many combinations of color and scent as you want at the base recipe. And you still, then you can make the same recipe uh, with a few alterations to give you, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve different scented bars of soap. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this process, and then we'll be back for the very last step. Okay, the very last step I take is to stamp um, the soap. So we like to stamp our company logo uh, into each bar. So I took a piece of 1 inch HDPE uh, plastic and I cut it into a two by three inch bar and I carved our logo and Lifejevity Soap Company into a stamp. So now I simply take that stamp and stamp each bar. For this process, Isopro my mold a little bit. Isopro won't in any way um, damage your soap. It'll simply uh, dissipate off and I just give it a little push and pull it and then you've got a beautiful logo on our soap. So I do that for uh, each of our bars of soap and then I can usually get, uh, I don't know, five or six uh, out of a stamp. Now 
I made my own stamps. I said, I think I mentioned earlier, I happen to um, own a, a tabletop CNC machine. So I designed a little stamp up on uh, my CNC uh, software and uh, cut these uh, stamps myself. And I have a stamp for uh, my organic soap. I have a stamp for uh, my goat's milk soap. And then this is our um, uh, all natural soap. So it's a um, uh, really, really great little thing. Uh, what have we found in our experience over the years is that um, people, two types of soap you can make. Novelty is what we call it. And those are the ones where, you know, you have, you know, possibly ridges on it and, uh, you know, people are sprinkling oatmeal and, you know, additives, uh, flower petals on top of it. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, but what you end up with is what I call a novelty bar of soap. And what a novelty bar is, in my definition, um, it's a one-off sale, right? So if someone's going to come, they're going to say, oh, isn't that pretty? They're going to buy it for a gift for somebody. And that customer will, will come and go. And uh, nine out of ten times, you know, you won't see them again. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a novelty. Um, the reason I cut my soap into nice square two-by-three bars, I put a nice company logo on it, I wrap them up. Uh, real, uh, so they look professional, is so that it becomes a daily use bar. And part of your goal in starting a soap company is to develop a loyal uh, customer following that uh, use your soap daily, um, not just buy it for gifts. And in that way, you establish loyal repeat customers and your business can grow um, fairly quickly. Now, I did mention in the last segment that this is um, a video series that I'm doing, and the video series is uh, a companion series uh, to the book I wrote, So You Want to Be a Soap Maker. Now that book is a comprehensive beginner's guide on how to be a soap maker from conception uh, to startup to making and selling um, your first bar of soap everything that takes, all the steps you have to take, all the things you have to get yourself involved in uh, to start and run a successful soap making company, uh, hopefully taking your business into a six-figure business and beyond. So uh, you can find the link for that book uh, down below if you want a really comprehensive guide. Um, go ahead and pick that up. I think you'll find that uh, uh, well worth the effort and the um, the, the paperback version, you know, a little expensive because you got to obviously pay for the, the printing and, you know, the book itself and, and physical distribution, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the Kindle version, uh, if you like uh, uh, doing any online um, reading, uh, it's cheap, uh, uh, great to use on a tablet. Um, so uh, consider that. Uh, in that book, you'll find, uh, you know, traits of running a successful business, how to set your shop up what tools you need in your shop, what type of business you should start, uh, how to uh, make your own labels, um, how to set a website up for yourself because obviously um, you know, it's great to have soap but you have to sell it. Uh, talks about um, uh, markets and uh, online retailers and how you establish and, and get set up with all that kind of stuff. And if you are counting the bars of soap here, you'll notice that I'm missing two that's because when I switched videos, the wife swooped in and snafu'd two bars, one for a shower, one for a sink. And I'm like, don't wash the profits down the drain. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, lavender's her favorite. She likes it fresh off the pot. So she came and swooped in and took a few boxes. So the other um, thing you're going to find here is uh, some links down below. We did mention that as well. So you can find some companion videos which are going to absolutely spectacular which are going to uh, you find a video down there on how to make a website for yourself as well uh, how to make a label for yourself from scratch um, how if you want to see the next process here um, this video is now finished but if you want to see the next process in actually labeling this soap uh, there's a companion video down there as well so go ahead and uh, and click on that link if you'd like uh, so a number of companion videos and uh, all information on how to be a successful soap maker. So there we go. We've got now only 34 bar, 32, 30 bars of lavender, um, all-natural uh, soap, which is just absolutely wonderful. 
That smells great. So I'm going to set this aside in my curing room. It'll cure for seven days. Then I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you so much for spending uh, your time with me for this video. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, please hit that like, uh, the thumbs up. Uh, please share it. Uh, and if you want to help um, uh, Soap Maker out and uh, you did enjoy the video, um, do those things. And uh, as well, uh, there's a link um, down there, a resource link below the video. And if you would like to use some of the items I use to make soap, um, I do have that in a resource link where you can go ahead and, and pick those things up or some of those things. Um, and that would help me out as well. I do get a, a small commission if you do go that route. Um, and of course, that would be appreciated. So thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And uh, uh, more videos to follow. How to make cream, lip balm, deodorant, linen sprays, and shampoo bars, and much more. So subscribe and hit that little bell as well. And you'll get notification when I do release those videos. Have a great day.